Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megar's Monthly Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is Best Field Practices for Testing Instrument Transformers CTs, VTs, and CVTs. My name is Michael Fleischer and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Megar. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you'll see control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. All webinar attendees are eligible to receive one NIDA CTD and one PDH or .1 CEU for attending. You will receive this in an email within two business days of the webinar. That email will also include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to a video recording of the webinar if you'd like to watch it again or share with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation and they will be answered at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Our presenter today is Daniel Carreño, Applications Engineer. Also to assist with the Q&A session, we will have two panelists joining us today. We have Diego Robolino, Mega Principal Engineer, and Dinesh Chajir, Technical Support Group Manager. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Thank you, Mike. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone joining the session. Uh, certainly appreciate the interest. Obviously, we hope that this is, this presentation is, is useful for your day-to-day -day activities or you learn something new. Thank you also to my, my colleagues, uh, Dinesh and Diego, for being in the panel for today's uh, session. So as Mike already said, today we're going to discuss uh, field testing for instrument transformers, CTs, CVTs, and VTs, right? And obviously wanna start the presentation with some basic definitions just to make sure we are all uh, in the same page, followed by obviously the main discussion, which is the field testing of these uh, instrument transformers covering each of the three that we, we put the, uh, in the title, the CTs, VTs, and CBTs. And at the end, just finalize with some uh, recommendations and alternative uh, test techniques uh, for CTs, you know, to make uh, the, the, the test either more efficient or to achieve uh, certain measurements that were not possible before. Like I said, I'm um, gonna start the, the presentation with very basic definitions and just to, to make sure we're all in the same page. And obviously, the very beginning is to ask ourselves, okay, what it's an, an instrument transform, right? These devices are intended to transmit an information signal to either a measuring uh, device or circuit or a protective or control uh, device. Right? These uh, devices, these instrument transformer intended to have a secondary circuit with a definite and known portion of the current or voltage in the primary uh, circuit to which uh, they are connected. That secondary quantity, again, either voltage or current, um, you have a, a phase relationship, again, with respect to, to the primary. So that is obviously the general definition, right? Instrument transformer. So let's look at each one of the ones we are uh, discussing today. The current transformer, again, is uh, borrowing from that initial uh, definition. On this case, this device, uh, the secondary current under normal conditions of use, right? Uh, it will be substantially uh, proportional to the primary current with the different in, fa in phase by an angle, which is approximately zero for the appropriate direction and uh, the proper connection. Right? Similarly, in the case of the voltage transformer, it is an instrument transformer in which that secondary voltage, and again, in normal, normal conditions of use, it is substantially proportional to that primary voltage. And just like, again, just as the current transformers, that secondary voltage will differ in phase from that in the primary, in which that angle is approximately zero again with the connections are uh, appropriate. 
obviously you guessed it and on the CVT, the definition is pretty much the same, right? On this case, uh, a device compromising a capacitor divider unit and an electromagnetic unit as well, commonly called as EMU. They are both interconnected, so that secondary voltage we read from the CVT, again, substantially proportional to that uh, primary voltage. But the first in phase, once again, that is with by an angle, which is approximately zero for the proper connection. So now that we have uh, the definition, we know what those three instrument transformers are. What do we use them for? primarily for two main applications. The first one is metering, right? In which we need obviously a high degree of accuracy, right? Metering sometimes or most of the time is using for revenue purposes, right? It is really important for both the provider and, and the user, right, or the customer, that that device is actually uh, uh, reporting the, the proper uh, secondary voltage or current again with certain degree of accuracy uh, for the rated primary or rated voltage. The second application is protection. Right? When those devices, any of those instrument transformers is are connected to uh, a protection uh, circuit. Again, in this case, we have the special uh, uh, condition or situation that in some cases that uh, primary current or that primary voltage is going to exceed the rated uh, values by a factor of many, many times, right? So we want to ensure that in even in those special situations that or those instrument transformers are able to, to report, to have to have again a substantial proportional value on the secondary circuit. So again, you notice that both applications really, really important. And in both is of utmost importance to make sure that the accuracy of um, the instrument transformer is within the specified limit. So that is why we want obviously to make sure that in the field when we have these devices installed, we want to ensure uh, reliability and again that um, whatever device we are dealing with is still within uh, the limit specified either by the manufacturer or our own limit right defined by the application that we are dealing with. So I'm showing you here a graph right, from a C-grade publication. Really interesting that, that this um, an entity conducted a survey right, of many, many users. And again, among other information, found this very, very interesting, showing the different failure modes, right? And I'm only showing you here the two major failures, which I, again, the secret uh, categorizes as either fire and explosion, which is obviously a catastrophic failure of uh, an instrument transformer, or the other is still bad enough that represent a major failure that represents pretty much replacing that uh, device in our system. You can see in the graph very, very clear dielectrics, right? Dielectric failure, either internal or external, are a very big uh, cause of, of major failures of instrument transformers, followed by electrical connections, again, both in the primary and the secondary, and then the other types of issues, which again, not saying not, not important, but again, the takeaway from this graph is that electrics are the main source, at least for the major failures of uh, instrument transformers in the field. If we look, from a different angle, just separating by type of instrument transformer. Again, you see the story is not much different. Dielectrics is, again, uh, the main cause of, of failure for both the uh, fire and explosive and all of the other uh, major failures for, for these devices. 
So hence, obviously, the need for testing, the need for maintenance, uh, predictive, predictive uh, testing for this type of devices. So what can we do in the field? And for that, we're going to separate them, right? We're going to discuss uh, first our CTs. Like, what can I do with the CTs in the field, again, to ensure reliability, to ensure my, my CT is still uh, provide, providing what I need in terms of you know, accuracy, depending on my application. So the tests that I can do in the field are going to be ratio and polarity, saturation, saturation measurement, secondary winding resistance, insulation, and the burden with some uh, uh, special considerations, obviously, we are uh, going to discuss. All of these tests are described in the standards, both the, I, both, both the IEEE and the IEC. Right, so let's start with the ratio test. For this measurement, we have available pretty much two methods. Right, The first one is sometimes called primary injection or the current method. As you can see in the slide, on this case, we will need uh, an AC current source that we're going to connect. And here is with our primary side of our, our current transformer, inject a current and measure that resulting induced current in the secondary side of our, our current uh, transformer. Obviously, this pretty much reproducing the exact same condition of the CT when it's in service, right? A second method I have available is called the voltage method. As opposed to the first one, the current method, in this case, I'm using a voltage source. But notice that the connections are different, right? The voltage that I'm applying is no longer applied on the primary, but on the secondary. This is done pretty much uh, for two reasons. The one, and I would say the most important, is safety, right? We, whatever voltage we are using for the test, we want to ensure that that resulting induced voltage on, on the other side of the transformer is less of that that I'm applying. So safety-wise, that will ensure that I know always with what type, what level of voltage I'm working on. And the second is, you know, there is the compromise of having the right unit to perform the test. So obviously, um, if I want to do the opposite, need a higher voltage and that will make the, the test not feasible to perform in, in, the, in the field. So again, using a voltage source, applying on the secondary side, measuring the resulting uh, voltage on the primary side of the CT and calculating, calculating that relationship. Very important to highlight in this case, the test itself is not exactly intended to prove the accuracy of the CT in question, but simply to prove that the ratio as installed, uh, it is specified or it is complying with the application of which I need the, this CT for. If I have a multi-tab CT, if tabs are available, I'm also uh, proving or, or making sure those tabs are correctly connected and those tabs are also providing the ratio within the, the needed or the specified limit, right? While I'm uh, performing this test, I'm also, I can also determine polarity, right? This will prove that the secondary current or the current direction in my secondary is the proper direction for my application. This is particularly important in certain situations, for example, uh, uh, differential protection, right? It's not uncommon that we will find, especially you know, in commissioning CTs that were incorrectly installed. And by incorrectly installed, I mean just flipping the, the CT will reverse the direction on, on the, of the secondary current. And again, that will pose a big uh, issue in the field. So while well, our duration, I can also determine polarity. And again, to make sure that that direction of my secondary current is the one needed for that particular system. Then we move on to 
saturation in this case, I also need a voltage source. So you're applying a voltage on the secondary side, measuring the current that is uh, generated by that uh, voltage. And I performed this test to confirm that this, the CT is of the correct accuracy, right? The, the one needed for the application of it within the limits by the, the specified uh, nameplate. And I can also cover issues like shorter turns on my secondary or maze wiring of, of the CT. So again, if I have a multi-tab CT, can discover if any of those tabs are uh, incorrectly wired or maybe a certain tab was determined to be used for that particular installation and, and the, the wiring was done to a different tab to that uh, specified. An example of how those uh, saturation curves look, and you're looking at a multi-tab CT where I have one curve for each one of the tabs uh, tabs combination in that particular CT. Right? So again, I will have a curve for each one of those tabs, and you see that line drawn at 45 degrees, right? With that, when once we have the the curve, the measured curve from the test, we can determine what is called the knee point, right? We have uh, here in the state two different standards to calculate that. Um, find that knee point in the curve, those are called ANSI 45 and ANSI 30. Right? And that's pretty much the different angle at which I can find that uh, tangent in the curve. And that will mark the change from the linear uh, performance of the CT to the non-linear, right? In other words, obviously we want to work with that CT in the linear uh, part of the performance because that means that we, we can confidently predict what will be the performance at different uh, levels of primary current. Past that knee point, we can no longer trust that that current in the secondary is a, a, a representation, a proportional representation of my primary current. That is a saturation. Then we move on to insulation, right? From the graphs that we look at the beginning, a really important test, right? Making sure that that dielectric is, is still in good working condition, or maybe I can detect early detect of, of any degradation happening in, in my CT, right? Typically, because the insulation resistance testing on TTs, we perform three different measurements primary to secondary, primary to ground, and secondary to ground. I can perform this either with an instrument that is specifically made for CT testing or with simple insulation resistance testers. Then we move on to the final, the burden, right? You see that I put the little asterisk for this. As you can see in the diagram in the slide, this is not a measurement done in the CT itself, but rather that load that we are connecting to the secondary of my CT. We perform this test to verify that that load, that burden that we are connecting to our CT secondary is within the limits of the accuracy class of my CT, right? When we look at the nameplate on our CT, we get a burden specification, and that means that the city or the manufacturer is guaranteeing the performance that is telling us in the, in the specs of the city should be valid within those burden limits. So we obviously want to make sure that that load we are connecting to the cities is not outside those limits. This was particularly important right in the old day of electromechanical relays. Nowadays, you know, the industry moving away from those, we already know those are still installed widely, but again, the industry is slowly moving to the microprocessor really, so that becomes, uh, I wouldn't say less important, but probably a worry that is uh, 
a little bit below in the list, but again, still something you can perform when testing your CT. Another very important highlight of this is, again, if you look at the circuit, you are connecting to that burden. If you have any type of protective device, any type of alarm, you wanna make sure those are offline. You will be injecting a current in that circuit. And again, you can keep with any protection in that. You wanna make sure those are offline if you want to perform these tests. So that is all the tests, or those are all the tests that I can perform on CTs. Let's move on onto the BTs, and we know that uh, we have uh, uh, friends joining us for several parts from several parts of the world. So just to make it clear, we know inductive BTs, BTs, or PTs. We know those are called uh, potential transformers in other parts of the world. Just going to refer them as VTs throughout the presentation. So what can I do? Ratio and polarity as well. Secondary winding resistance, insulation resistance, and the secondary short circuit impedance. Okay. Going on, obviously, you know, the whole purpose of having all these types of uh, devices, all my instrument transformers, is to get an accurate representation of that quantity in the primary, in this case, my primary voltage. So same reasons as for the CT, we want to make sure that that is still within the needed um, limits for, for my particular application. Uh, really important, you see, I'm using the same type of device to show you how to, to make connections in the field. And it's really important that we as, as the individuals running the test, that we know that instrument we are using to, to perform the measurement, right? In other words, which connections, which leads I'm using, where is my source from, again, the instrument that I'm using? You see the little uh, caution uh, legend that I put in the slide. So I'm using uh, the exact same instrument in this case for this example. So this particular instrument has the source on the secondary side, these are the X people we call X1S and X5S in the slide. So in the case of a BT, right, we said before uh, for the ratio test, I want to step down the voltage. In this case, I'm going to connect connect those X leads to the high voltage side of, of my BT, right? And then I will use my H1 and H2 to measure the resulting voltage, the induced voltage on the secondary side of my BT. So just be mindful of, of that situation. Again, the key is for you to know the instrument and understand how the instrument that you're using is actually performing the test. Another you know, factor we need to be aware of is that we need to check the manufacturer requirements in terms of accuracy. Depending on type of T, type of construction, sometimes um, the voltage needed to get the, the rated the specified accuracy has to be certain percentage of um, the rated voltage. So if that is the case, it's obviously a field limitation and related to the instrument as well. If the instrument that you have available doesn't have enough voltage right, to reach that percentage, sometimes uh, of 5%, then it doesn't mean that you cannot perform the test. We go back to the same type of consideration we did with CTs. You can still perform the test. You will not be verifying accuracy, but as long as the results are still within the nameplate specifications, the results, the ratio of results can still be uh, considered acceptable again for your application. So one thing to, to note while performing this test in the field, secondary winding resistance, and we want to make sure that circuit still intact, no shorter turns, and no, wire, no high resistance from the terminals of the VT all the way to my controller, the section of the circuit where I'm performing the test. 
And we also use that resistance value for um, modeling the VT. I'm gonna discuss that, discuss that a little bit later. So just again, connecting to the secondary side, injecting a DC current, measuring uh, the resulting drop in the circuit. And that way we can uh, calculate the resistance of that circuit. Moving on to insulation, once again, going referring back to that initial slide of the major failures of instrument transformers. Um, in this case, these two measurements recommended, the first one being from the primary side, high voltage versus all the secondary and ground together, just like the, the diagram or the picture rather I'm showing you uh, in the slide. And the second test being measuring or testing each one of the secondaries in case you have multiple secondaries in the VT versus all of the other secondaries plus high voltage plus, plus ground. And that plus obviously means short circuiting the remaining secondaries, ground and the primary side of the transformer together. So, those are the insulation resistance measurements you can perform, but it's not the only way to assess uh, insulation in a VT, right? We have other options, uh, partial discharge measurement, either online, right, with a monitor system, an online monitor system of partial discharge or offline measurements as well. If um, the VT is uh, oil insulated, and if it's possible to take samples of oil, then obviously that, that that oil can be tested as well to, to make sure there's still the dielectric capabilities are still within the, the allowed limit. And interestingly, you can also perform DFR again if you have an oil insulator, paper oil insulated uh, VT. If the, the VT you are dealing with is uh, of dry insulation, any type of epoxy or resin. Um, insulation, then partial discharge still recommended either online as an option or, or offline and insulation resistance. Right? Obviously no oil test, no DFR, but you still have those uh, two options, insulation resistance and partial discharge measurement, either online or offline. And then finally, going into the secondary short circuit impedance, right? You can obviously from that measurement you can determine copper losses of um, the the VT, as well as you know, calculate certain uh, parameters of the the VT used to model the the VT in question and and can uh, calculate or predict its performance in the field. And moving on to PVTs, right? Probably you see the trend ratio and polarity of, uh, is of utmost importance to, to test in all my instrument transformers. So we're gonna perform that measurement as well. Capacitance measure, measurements as well as tan delta, right? The insulation analysis. We're gonna discuss it in a couple slide, slides. Main components of the CVTs, right? Where we have our capacitor our voltage dividers, the more prominent in, in these pictures. Then we have our, our EMU, our electromagnetic um, unit consisting of usually a reactor and an intermediate uh, VT, an inductive VT, right? So, for the ratio and polarity, same considerations we did with the VT, right? We want to know exactly how the instrument we are using for this test uh, works so we, we can make the proper connections. In this example, I'm showing you, again, connecting my voltage source, right? My X1 and S and my X5S directly to the primary of the CBT and then measuring the secondary voltage uh, in the EMU. Right. Very important highlight CVTs are typically highly accurate. Right. I'm showing you the the accuracy classification as per the IEC standard, the IEC 61869-5. Uh, 
you see pretty uh, accurate devices. And one thing I like about these tables, you show application um, for each one of those uh, classes of accuracy. You know, we have laboratory, obviously high precision, as well as uh, revenue and metering precisions up to 0.5. Then we go into the industrial grade meters, which are 1.0 class. And then going to the protections, the 3P and 6P. And important of also in this table, looking at the ratio percentage uh, limits for the errors for both the ratio and the phase displacement where we perform the measurements in the field. And again, just assessing insulation, we can perform tan delta uh, measurements, right? Important to point out, right, with as power factor measurements and delta, this is an averaging test. Right? So we are looking at the insulation system of the CBT as a one entity, right? Uh, we're really going to check the, the, the condition of that paper oil insulation system with this measurement. In general terms, those values, those tan delta values should be within 0.2 and 0.5%. Uh, another important recommendation for this particular measurement is to establish our basins, to establish um, those initial numbers either in commissioning or when our, our, our CBT is in a good known state. And so we want to make, perform these measurements again to establish uh, uh, both the capacitance and the tan delta values as reference for future uh, maintenance tests. Right? With power factor, we know temperature will affect, changes in temperature will affect our reading. So really important that we need to make a note in, in every test we make for, for this uh, particular uh, test. So we know again, and when comparing in the future, if our temperature is not the same, we need to make the appropriate um, corrections for temperature. When we perform the tan delta measurements, we typically recommend to do it on each of the capacitors right of the of the voltage divider. Then another measurement for the EMU, the electromagnetic unit, and a final third test comprising the whole CBT as, a, as, a, as an entity, right? So three measurements, the capacitors individually, the EMU, and then the whole CBT together. The, the general guidelines in terms of analysis for these measurements, for tan delta, for the capacitors, one a, a, a value of more than 0.3%, the EMU, and the whole unit more than 1%. And once again, just making uh, emphasis on that these tests, again, looks at the, the bulk insulation, the insulation system as a whole, and is not to be used, the intention is not to detect or predict a localized issue with the insulation. And finally, the capacitance, right? We measure the capacitance, again, in those elements of our, our voltage divider. Any variation between all of, of those elements in one CBT will obviously indicate either an internal damage of the primary insulation or a defect from fabrication or poor uh, quality control in terms of you know the fabrication of all of those individual elements. Just like with tan delta, we suggest that the, the reference measurements are taken for capacitance as well. So those are the field of test, again, just going to CVTs, IVTs, and CVTs. And then going back to those uh, tests that we recommended for CTs, what alternative techniques do I have available? And why do we need to look for alternatives? If we look at the traditional way of performing these measurements, right on the first, the left um, diagram, you can see a, a typical instrument tester will have you know, my source, 
and then a secondary uh, a circuit for metering, right? So I can measure either induced voltages or current. So if I have a multi tap CT, all the different measurements that we discussed, ratio and polarity, winding resistance and saturation, I need to perform all of those in all the different tap uh, combinations, right? If I have, a, a again, a, a unit or using a method, the traditional method, I will have to make those measurements one by one by, for all the different types uh, combinations. Then we have the other type, types of instruments with provisions to connect all the tabs in my CT, but still I am performing all those measurements one by one, and by that I mean, okay, I will select X1, X2, and perform all my battery of testing. Once I finish, then move on to X1, X3, repeat the process, and so on and so forth. So it's a time, very time consuming um, way to perform the, the test. So what alternatives do I have? The first one is all concurrent measurement, right? You see this diagram doesn't look much different from the one on on the right on this slide that went back. Uh, the difference is that the instrument will be able to perform concurrent measurements. What do I mean by that? So when performing ratio, I will be able to measure all the tabs combination ratios at the same time. The same applies for winding resistance and saturation, right? So I wanted to show you a, a, a quick example. Right? I have a, an animation, a video, hoping that it goes correctly in, in the webinar transmission. Uh, it's, it's sped up, it's speed up in, in the slides, right? It takes maybe a couple of minutes, but I wanted to show you how those concurrent measurements uh, look when I'm actually performing the test. I'm only gonna show you one example for saturation, right? So I have, a five tab CT, I have all my different tabs combinations on the left. And again, additionally, I will have to test X1, X2, perform the test, finish, go to the next one, X1, X3, and so on and so forth. So all these different combinations one by one. Doing concurrently, how does it look while I'm running the test again hoping the video shows well in the webinar transmission so you can see i'm making measurements concurrently right again this in in real life in practice i will um it will take probably a couple of minutes but still when when i apply this technique to both to saturation winding resistance and ratio and polarity I will save a tremendous amount of time, right? It will speed up my my testing time tremendously, right? So it's a very, very good thing to make my testing more efficient. And again, most of the time, most often than not, we go out in the field not to test only one CT, but 15, 20, 30 CT. So this will help a lot reducing that testing time. And again, this technique, the concurrent measurements, I'm only showing you the graph for saturation, but below I have the results for ratio uh, and polarity as well as winding resistance. So those three measurements are the ones that are, I'm gonna be able to measure concurrently. Another advantage of, of having the concurrent uh, technique is for ratio, right? I can uh, detect if any of the tabs were incorrectly connected. Right? The ratios of these algorithms will check for the proper steps on those tabs. So if one doesn't match the, the predicted uh, uh, ratio, I will get an alert. And again, it's another way I can find a miswiring of those CT tabs. The second technique I want you to talk about uh, is a DC excitation, right? When we perform a saturation, and I'm showing just an example in the slide, 
to take to think about a C800, right? The protection class DT, it will require a minimum of 400 volts AC. Like we said, we perform this actuation test with applying AC on the secondary side. And in some instances, like we will require up to 1300 volts to achieve one amp of uh, excitation current. So going into the higher voltage, right? Another example for transient type CTs, that test voltage for saturation can easily reach the 4000 volt mark or, or even more to achieve one amp of saturation. So again, this will um, pose the, the limitation or the need rather to, to have a considerable size unit, right, to achieve those voltages. That plus will make my, my testing unsafe, right? So what happens is, let's look at this graph now, again, looking at the AC method, but what will happen if we change the frequency, right? If you see, we have four curves in the, in the graph. The first one being the green, applying that test voltage at, with a frequency of, of 120 Hertz. In this case, I mean, we stopped at 10 kV, right? Of test voltage, and we couldn't even see past that linear uh, behavior of, on that curve. We don't know if that the knee point, or at what point we were able to reach the knee point. But again, if you look, if we go down in frequency, that knee point goes down in voltage, so as you can see in that uh, uh, formula equation, that um, magnetic flux density is proportional to that relationship between voltage and frequency, right? So this leads, you, leads us to the DC method, right? which is a method that is described in the IEC 61869-2, right? It will, uh, describe how we can use an actual DC method to perform the saturation test. So how does that work? If we look in this slide, right, then going back to the AC method, that magnetic flux level that we need to achieve in the case of the AC method, if we need a higher flux for those largest CTs or the transit type CTs, Again, if we need to increase that flux, the only way we can achieve that higher flux is increasing the voltage, right? In our AC waveform, as you can see, the time is kept constant. We are applying that voltage at a given frequency. And again, all we can do to achieve a higher flux is increasing the voltage. In the case of DC, okay, to achieve the same flux, we can keep the voltage constant, but increase the time we use to apply that voltage to, and to reach that saturation region. So after we reach that region, we can mathematically convert back the results to the AC equivalent. Right? So this will give us two advantages. First one, in terms of safety, right? we will not need those very high voltages as those it is with high, knee, high voltage knee point. So that will make my test safer. And second, and a really important advantage is that it will allow us to perform the test on, on CTs of those special applications or the higher uh, classifications for which we have higher uh, knee point voltages to test it with this technique, right? How does it look in terms of the results? Again, like just showing a couple of examples, or showing four different CTs, two in the top C400, two in the bottom C800. The red line is the saturation curve that we were able to measure using the traditional AC method. The black dotted line the curve that we achieve using the DC method. You see they line up pretty much right on top of each other. Also are indicating the knee point with a red uh, circle for the AC method. 
written with the black X mark for the DC method. You can see again, line pretty much one on top of each other. So pretty much the similar results. And once again, the technique will allow us to test uh, CTs with higher knee point uh, voltages. In, in this example, I'm showing you in the slide a knee point that is close to 15 kb, right, using the DC uh, method in this case. And the, the method will allow us to test up to 30 kb uh, knee point in the field. So that sums up pretty much um, all the technical side that I, I wanted to share with you today. I want to end the presentation just taking the couple last minutes to talk to you about obviously about the mega offering in terms of uh, instrument transformer testing. We have a couple of uh, instruments, the MRCT being the first one, right? Obviously with the ability to do the concurrent measurements for ratio winding resistance and saturation. The unit can be used to test VTs and CVTs. And you have the option of uh, enabling the DC excitation technique to test those uh, higher knee points up to 30 kV, as I said before, uh, with the unit. Then we have its brother, as sometimes I say, right? The MVCT of the, uh, a unit also to test, in this case, VTs and CT only with the option to, to enable also the DC excitation uh, technique to test those higher knee point uh, CT. Both units will give you a report. Uh, once you run the test, again, it will take you a few minutes. You will get a full feature report for your CT, VT, and in the case of, of the MRCT, the uh, CVT in just a minute. Both units will also have the option of an integrated 1 kV DC insulator, insulation resistance uh, test. So full feature units for uh, CTs, VTs, and CVTs in case of the MRCT. And then finally, since we obviously discussed insulation measurements, uh, we have our Delta 4000 a series of units to test power factor tan delta, not only in this case of uh, VTs or CVTs, but in any type of electrical equipment, uh, you need to test power factor. And briefly discuss DFR, right? We're showing you the IDEX uh, 300 in, in the slide. We have a couple of units at 300 and 350, and full feature unit to perform DFR uh, measurements. If you're interested in, in any of the the two either DFR or power factor tan delta measurements. We have uh, fully dedicated webinars, again, just discussing all the technical side of uh, power factor and DFR measurements. And with that, I will take it over back to Michael. He has some information to share with you. All right, thank you, Daniel. Uh, at this time, the presentation portion of the webinar is officially concluded. We'll take a few minutes to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. For those of you that are leaving, we, uh, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate if you were to take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any of the mega products. A copy of this presentation, along with a link to the video recording of the webinar, will be emailed to everyone in about a week. Uh, you can also view video recordings of previous webinars on our website at us.mega.com slash webinars and register for next month's webinar, TAN Delta Testing on Medium and High Voltage Cable Systems. The presenter will be Javier Ruiz. All right, let's get to your questions. Uh, our first question is for Dinesh. Uh, how do we test a donut type CT using voltage tests? Uh, good morning, everyone. So when we talk about donut type CT, what we are doing is uh, we are using a method called a secondary voltage injection method. And uh, in that one, uh, whether you're performing ratio tests 
uh, or uh, if you want to do the, the saturation test, the process is kind of same. You apply the voltage on the secondary side and there will be an induced voltage. Uh, uh, even with the donor type CT, you would run a wire through it and there would be a voltage induced on the secondary, on the, on, the, on the primary side of the CT and that you can measure. It would be a very small amount of voltage yeah, depending upon the CT ratio but uh, you apply the voltage on the secondary side uh, of the CT and then you measure the induced voltage on the primary side and your meter should be capable of measuring in the range of less than 0.5 volt. So that's the tricky part. Uh, but, but yes, that's how it is being done. Uh, uh, and that was for the ratio test. For the saturation test, it, it's an open circuit test you energize the CT secondary and uh, measure the current flowing through the CT secondary and then the saturation test or excitation curve is nothing but a plot between the secondary voltage and the secondary current to determine the knee point. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question again is for Dinesh. If you uh, don't have an MRCT tester, can we use the DMM to test the resistance of the CT or VT? Uh, it, it, it's a two-part question. Uh, I will start with the CT. Uh, typically, when you do the winding resistance, obviously you are doing it on the secondary side of the CT uh, because primary is just the, the center conductor. Uh, when you're doing the test, uh, uh, the recommended method is to use uh, uh, a dedicated instrument because uh, Usually the inductance of those secondary winding is not much and then the resistance is also very small. So a very small current is being applied and you measure the voltage drop and that's how you get the resistance. Uh, so if you don't have a dedicated instrument, then yes, you can use uh, some current source, uh, DC current source and use a multimeter to do the measurement, but it's not recommended because as I said, like with the with the inaccuracy of the source and the the digital multimeter that you're using, uh, you may not get the right accurate measurement. Uh, for the VT part, same thing applies when you're talking about the the secondary side of the VT. And uh, usually in the test report, you would see that secondary side winding resistance is what we measure because measuring the primary side winding resistance can be difficult or challenging because you're talking about a high value sometime in kilo ohms and also the inductance associated with the winding can be a challenge. So, so uh, in, in all honesty, my recommendation that we, we should not be using a current source and, and, and a digital multimeter to, to run those kind of tests because it, there's a lot more detail involved when you talk about the winding that has inductance in it. So, so my recommendation would be to not use a DMM and a, and a source. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question is for Diego. In CVT tan delta, please suggest connection and mode of testing for all connection-like capacitor units. Electromagnetic units and complete units, please. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. I think that it's going to be a little bit difficult to explain just verbally what the connections are for, for the CVT and the different components on a tan delta. So what, what I would suggest is uh, we send you as part of the Q&A uh, package that is going to be provided after the webinar, just some hookup diagrams that you can look at it and that, that will be a better reference for you. All right, thanks. Uh, since we have you, our next question is also for you. What test do you recommend for uh, VTCT combo units for use for metering purposes? Okay, uh, very interesting question because we do find these combo units in the field. And one of the, the interesting things that you have to take into account is that the CT has to be tested as a pure CT and the VT has to be tested separately as just a pure VT. So you need to follow all the procedures, all the suggested testing procedures that you have for your CT as well as your PT. The combo unit may have just a little bit of a difference on the connections for your insulation power factor testing. And again, 
I think that that is something that we could uh, also provide some hookup diagrams for the, if you want to do a dielectric response test or a tan delta test. But other than that, all the procedures that are for CT has to be, have to be taken care of and everything that is for VT as well. All right, thanks. Uh, Diego, also, uh, how can we have better accuracy doing uh, ratio tests on CVT? When, when we perform a ratio test on a CVT, uh, the recommendation from the manufacturer typically is to apply a voltage that is not below 10% of the rated voltage of the unit uh, to be within accuracy. And, and that is an interesting factor. Nevertheless, it has been verified that if we apply a modeling compensation diagram to the system where we uh, apply enough voltage to excite the primary side and measure the secondary side, taking into account the losses that are in between this uh, transfer of energy from primary to secondary, then that will improve the accuracy of our measurement for ratio on the CVT. All right, thanks. Uh, Dinesh, uh, can the Mega MWA300 do any of the tests for instrument transformers? Okay. Uh, uh, before I answer that question for, for our audience who may not know what MWA300 is, uh, it, it's a mega winding analyzer, and it can perform turns ratio and winding resistance on power and distribution transformer. So coming to the question, uh, can Mega MWA300 do any of the tests for instrument transformers? Certainly, as Daniel talked about, that, that there are some tests called as ratio and polarity tests and winding resistance tests. So those tests can be performed uh, by uh, by MWA. Uh, when you're testing CVT, uh, when you're testing CTs, you just have to be careful that you 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 are uh, you are aware that on which side you are applying the voltage uh, but certainly you can perform the ratio test it does give you the phase angle uh, difference between the the two sides uh, primary and secondary through which you can find out whether the polarity is correct or not and then you can certainly do the winding resistance on that but the other tests such as the saturation burden those tests won't be able to be conducted using the MWA. One other thing I want to highlight is that it's very important for us to demagnetize the CT uh, and uh, uh, the right recommended method is to increase the voltage across the CT secondary, take it to the saturation and bring it back to zero. That's how you do the DMAG as per the IEEE standard and MWA uh, has the DMAG feature, but it's for power transformer, not for CT. So, uh, so you won't be able to perform the DMAG test on M with MWA on CT. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, we have a question for you. What is the accuracy of phase error measurements? Well, if it uh, quick, I, I think we can give this over to yeah Dinesh, uh, actually. Uh, so uh, hello. The um, question is kind of Dan Daniel. Do you want to answer? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I thought that you guys were not listening, or something happened with my audio. I'm not sure if I understand the, the question correctly. If uh, read it a couple of times, if the if it goes into the line of what would be the accuracy of which I can measure that uh, phase uh, displacement and by consequence the error, then it's obviously directed to the capabilities of the test instrument that you're using. For, for our the ones that we offer, we can share with you, you know, in the offline material, what are those capabilities of both the MRCT and the NVCT. If you uh, are asking on the line of what are my limits you know, when I perform the, the, the measurement and I get a, a result, then what what is the limit that it allowed, right? To be, uh, I go, I'll, let me go back to this slide, which is uh, where I show the table from the IEC standard, I get the 61869 
for the allowable errors, it, it depends on the accuracy class of the CBT. Right? If you're just taking one example for the 0.5 a class, your allowable error, the limit of the error is 20 minutes in this case. It's important to know the, the unit in the table. So it depends on the accuracy. I, I just want to add real quick uh, to Daniel's uh, uh, response, and Daniel obviously gave a very good answer. Uh, when you talk about the phase angle uh, uh, or, or, or phase displacement error measurement, uh, it, it obviously depends upon the specifications of that, that CT or VT or CVT. But one thing that you need to keep in mind is that when we are talking about CTs, uh, one of the important thing is that are they connected uh, uh, properly? In other words, is the polarity correct? And usually, a lot of time I've seen that the measurement that you would see would be in minutes, and one degree is 60 minutes. And if you wired the, the CT correctly and the CT is in good operation, you would see like like three minutes, five minutes, something to that effect. So uh, unless you are talking about CVTs, majority of the time when you talk about CTs, uh, people are more interested in the uh, in the polarity, and uh, and usually you would see zero degrees in three minutes, something to that effect. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, our next question uh, for, I guess, Diego is going to be, what is the advantages of using DC excitation technique over low frequency AC voltage technique to do CT saturation tests? Okay, we, we need to understand how the saturation of the core will work at different frequencies. Every time we reduce the frequency, you will see that the saturation is easier and it's uh, uh, it's, it's better acquired now on, on the core of the of the CT itself. So bringing it to very low frequencies, of course, uh, it, it, it's an improvement on the saturation process for for the core of the CT. When we are looking into pure DC, then of course it's it's an easy way to do the saturation. It will be a faster way to do the saturation of the core. And one thing that you have to remember is that. Uh, Saturation per se on the if we're talking about the saturation curve, most of the units will work typically on AC, right? And you will go cranking up all the voltage that you can. When you reach the limit of that voltage, then you can switch into DC and get your excitation or saturation curve to limits where the AC will not be able to reach. And one of the big benefits that we have with DC saturation is that if we look into CTs. Uh, transient CTs that are in the system like TPY or TPZ uh, type CTs, you can reach saturation of 20 kV, 30 kV with only 300 volt DC. Thanks. Uh, the next question for you is, what is the maximum reading resolution, uh, resolution when performing saturation on CTs? Well, again, when you guys are working on protection type CTs, right, and you look into the classification, at least from the IEEE side, the ANSI side, you will see that we have our C100, C200, 400, 800. But the limit typically is not just 800 volt. As I just mentioned, we can we can phase in the field saturation for transient type CTs that where you need to go all the way up to 10 kV, 20 kV, uh, sometimes even 30 kV. Uh, on the wide range, I would say that up to 4 kV is, is the majority of the CTs that we will have to do the test. But if you're getting into the transient type CTs, then you may reach voltages way beyond the, the 4 kV, all the way up to maybe 20, 30 kV. Thanks. Uh, this next question is going to be for you, Dinesh. Uh, could you please explain more on how to interpret the saturation curve with accuracy class? Okay, Th that's a very interesting question. Uh, if you go and look at the IEEE C57.13.1 standard, uh, it talks about performing the saturation test, but it does not provide any guideline on how to interpret those saturation curves. And let me explain why that is the case. So 
different manufacturers obviously design CTs differently. So the saturation curve that you are looking at is the property of the core material, the, the, the design, the parameters of the CT, those kind of, uh, of parameters. And uh, I will take an example of example, uh, as Diego mentioned that there is class C100, 200, C400, C800. And when, when I am looking at C800 CT, uh, my expectation is that uh, when the when the rated uh, when the fault current should not exceed more than 20 times the rated secondary current. So if the rated secondary current is uh, is uh, 5 amps and 20 times of that is 100 amps. So if your fault is is inducing or generating 20 times the rated secondary current. Uh, then the voltage across the CT secondary should not exceed 800 volt. That's what C800 means. So when you perform the saturation test, you can get values anywhere from, I have seen C C800 CT saturating at 550 volt. And then the same C800 uh, CT may have a saturation point of 1100 volt because there is no beyond C800. So your 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 knee point can vary all over the place. So the 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 one way that you need to look at is that uh, when you are defining how you're going to use the CT, you need to make sure that you 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 find out the knee point of that CT and make sure that your CT is operating in the linear region. That's how you want to to design your protection system. Now. When, when, uh, and I'm going to take uh, maybe 30 seconds more to further explain this thing. When you talk about the knee point, that's the point where the CT starts to saturate. Doesn't mean that the CT is completely saturated. And that's the reason why when you talk to some of the OEMs and everyone, they actually want to know the, 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 the voltage at at uh, at five amps or ten amps of the secondary current because uh, that's what they want to see because the CT may be completely saturated at that time. So uh, this this is a lengthy topic. Uh, we can go over for an hour on this thing, but just to give you an idea that when you talk about the the knee point, it is important to perform a baseline measurement when the CT is commissioned and make sure that that the knee point is around that. So it, it's a kind of a comparison. And also you want to make sure that whatever is the knee point for a certain class of CT, uh, it, it is meeting the design requirement or the protection scheme in which you're going to implement that CT. All right, thanks. I really appreciate that breakdown. Uh, so it looks like we, we've gone through a lot of really great questions here. We have a few more that we're probably going to have to reach out offline because they're very in-depth questions that deserve a more in-depth answer. So we'll probably be attaching a uh, an additional document to our email going out next week, along with the recording of our webinar and a copy of the PowerPoint. Uh, that additional uh, file will probably have a breakdown on some of the more uh, in-depth questions that were asked that we can't answer right now. Uh, or we'll be reaching out to you offline uh, in some cases. But I would thank you all for attending. Uh, if you could, please remember to answer the survey. The survey also includes a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. Uh, once again, thank you all for attending, and have a great weekend.